Good evening, everyone. My name is Pier Fassina, and I'm a glider pilot from an Emozzo Flight Center in the northeast side of Italy. This is the last event of this season, and then we can start gliding again. With our, with our club, Acao from Varese, we decide to organize this particular evening because we truly believe that it's time to open our windows to the future for our sport. I kindly ask to uh, uh, Eric Raymond, the father of the solar glider, Sansik du Duo, to open the window in the future with us, with his experience and his futuristic vision of the solar gliding. A big thank to Eric to be here with us tonight, sharing his long experience in this area. I'll be sure with his image, he will make you dream. One of uh, the coordinators tonight will be Andrea Venturini, a new pilot that last two years has done an amazing job promoting our sport and especially gliding sites on our country all over the world. He was lucky to fly with Alberto Cironi and is sharing this great opportunity through photos, video, and his article published in Sideplane and Gliding Magazine. And last but not least, the Facebook, the Facebook page he manages gliding and sewing that allow thousands of people to experience the beauty of our sport through this media. I will now introduce Mr. Aldo Cernetti, our moderator for this evening. I know uh, we will have a lot of questions, and for this reason, I ask you to pay attention to the, uh, the work of Alberto Cironi, who will explain how to place them. Okay, let's open this session. Have a nice evening, everybody. See you. Grazie, Pier Fax. Uh, buonasera a tutti, benvenuti. Uh, giusto due parole in italiano e poi verranno anche tradotte in inglese. Um, giusto un'informazione, questo è un webinar, come oramai forse sapete già tutti, eh, non avete un video o un microfono, però potete fare, naturalmente vedete video, vedete, sentite l'audio, sentite il relatore e i moderatori e potete ah. fare domande eh, con la question and answer o domande e risposte, è un bottone nella parte bassa dello schermo e eh, vi risponderemo, eh, prevalentemente daremo, gireremo queste domande a Eric che quindi vi risponderà personalmente. Eh, quindi a questo punto io non ho altre... La chat magari la usate solo per dei saluti, per delle considerazioni, per dei complimenti o delle critiche, ma eh, se invece vi aspettate una risposta durante il webinar, eh, usate per favore question and answer. Eh, lascio a questo punto la parola a, ad Aldo, che introdurrà Eric eh, e modererà la serata. Grazie e buona, e buona visione. Thank you very much, Alberto. Alberto Sironi, uh, a very famous Italian record man in gliding and uh, owner of Alpha Test, uh, is hosting this event thanks to his uh, Zoom facilities, professional Zoom facilities. We are, um, we panelists are all. Uh, uh, working from home, let's say working. We are in fact enjoying this evening. Um, the seminar is organized uh, via Zoom in the form of a webinar. That means uh, Eric will be presenting his uh, work, adventures, and uh, the building of his uh, solar powered aircraft. Uh, in one direction communication to the public. Um, all the participants may write uh, greetings as everybody's already do, been doing in the chat line. If you look below your screen in Zoom, you will see chat. That's for sharing uh, hello, goodbyes, how are you, etc while uh, the Q and H questions and answers sections, domande e risposte, is for asking something in written form. Uh, we panelists will be alleviating the work by Eric. We will re be reading all both the chat and the Q and H lines. 
and we will report questions to Eric when we, we think it will be the, the appropriate moment, or sometimes we may answer directly if we know the exact answer to your question. So I'd say thank you everybody for being here. We have um, extremely qualified participation from all over the world. Uh, we have seen uh, lots of greetings, Eric, and lots of oh, greetings okay. to you from uh, Jean-Marie Clément. Um, from I see some from, from Arizona and New Mexico also. Exactly, from Scotland. From uh, from Florida, yeah, from Germany, from from Slovenia, and from Switzerland, etc., and from Central California. Yes. Now, Jean-Marie Clement also. Texas. <laughs> That's great. We we really have a qualified participation. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Centro Volovela in Emonzo, Charlie Victor November Echo for organizing this. And thank you to the club I own. Um, I'm, the, I'm a member of ACAO, uh, Alpha Charlie, Alpha Oscar Club in Varese, too. So thank you, everyone. Eric, it's your turn now. Thank you very much for okay. being here. Okay, well, be, be, before I start the presentation, I'll just show the solar cells I'm using. They're from Sun Power Corporation, and they're the very low cost cells used on houses. So, and I have a little piece of the, the wing here. You can wow. see, and uh, the, it's uh, spar caps are carbon prepreg, so it's a little bit higher technology than a normal cell plane, but very similar. So, you can see it's, it's, uh, it's strong enough, but you'll see more. So I start the presentation now, I guess. It also, it also seems like it's very, very light. Uh, yes. Okay, so wait, I'm touching share screen. Ah, okay. So I have to click on this and start. And then I go, oops, no, I have to minimize. No, 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 minimize that. Too kind of you. Better. Okay. <laughs> Like that. So, um, yes, this I'd like to make some comments about this first picture I chose. Um, this I took this picture in 2009 during a national sailplane competition in Slovenia, and it was not a very good day. Uh, you can see it's mostly cloudy this day, and I flew for about one hour with the other with the competitors. You can see three of them here uh, flying around under the clouds, very low cloud base. And I'm sure they thought that my glider was pretty slow and maybe not really the best glider in the sky. But after about an hour, I became bored. So I just went up over the clouds and explored for a while. And so it's really a completely different animal um, because you can take advantage of the sunlight above the clouds. So let me give a definition of a solar-powered airplane. Um, the accepted definition now is an airplane that can maintain level flight on direct solar power. Um, and of course, that's not true at all times. We're talking about at least four hours in the summertime. So it needs a big wing, as you can see here. I'm getting about four and a half kilowatts from this wing which is more than enough for level flight, as you'll see. But I'm going to be jumping around from some different topics. So this is a table of contents. So let's get started. And please stop me if I'm going too fast or something. So I test flew the Sunseeker Duo at Voghera Rivanazzano Airport, just at the base of the Apennini Mountains. And it was really a perfect place um, because we had unlimited use of the runway. I made a lot of runway flights where I just flew straight line. And we really were able to test the airplane very well. It was a perfect, perfect place to test fly this airplane and excellent soaring. So we're limited to the airspace. Um, this is the absolute limit of... Uh, 
airspace restrictions here because of uh, approach to Milan and Genoa. So, um, and here's my wife who helped me build the airplane. And this was, we made a cross country flight to Pavulo, which is another wonderful airport. And you'll see more about that later. And it's higher also, in the mountains. Yes, yes, it's a beautiful place. This is right after we returned we just landed coming back from Pavulo, and we actually are flying all year, every month. Um, even in the winter time, we had some very good winters flying in Volgera, at the Apennine Mountains, North End. And uh, they have an active glider club. You can see their hangar and their, their trailers there. And just some beautiful castles. And you can see the Mediterranean in the distance. So even in the winter time. And I would like to point out in this picture, you can see my wingtip is very up here. When I first started fl flying the airplane, I had 12 degrees of dihedral on this part of the wing, but later I reduced it. Now it's only three degrees. I found out that I don't need so much stability on the wings. So, and it's also better for the solar power to not have so much dihedral in the wing tips. So anyway, flying at Volguera. So a little bit of history. This is my first solar powered airplane that I built between 1986 and 1990 but it really, it does not qualify as a solar powered airplane because the, this was very thin amorphous solar cells that only produced 250 watts. So really this was a glider that could recharge its batteries slowly in the air, but I was able to fly it across the United States in 21 flights. So you'll see a little more about that later. And later I built a new wing for that same airplane. And then it became a real solar powered airplane because now it has, um, let me think, it had, I think one and a half kilowatts. So much what, more what, power. And this what was the wingspan of this? This is 17 meters oh. wingspan. And it's, yeah. Uh, the 16 and a half, actually. The, the, yeah, this one was actually more wingspan. This was 17, and this was a little bit less, but more wing area. So, and uh, yes, here it is on a dry lake bed. Uh, a friend of mine had a solar powered drone. Uh, you see it here that this is the first solar airplane that made a 24 hour flight and 48 hour flight. And we're flying it from inside this trailer here. Is this the one by engineer Cocconi? Alan Cocconi, Alan yes. Cocconi. Yes, he was a very important member of my of my team. And he made the peak power trackers and he helped me build the motor for this airplane, for example. So he helped me with a lot of the electronics. Very good. Yes, he's actually Swiss Italian. Cocconi is an Italian name, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, he speaks French, though, not Italian. I'm sorry. Sure. He's from Switzerland, actually. So um, now I'm going to describe a um, typical mission. This was our flight um, to the islands of Elba and Corsica. And what I'd like to describe here, um, we took off Volguera in not very good conditions. And if you can see my mouse arrow here, about where I have the mouse was when we stopped soaring and we just went on solar power. So the rest of this flight was combination of batteries, but we made it to Elba with more than half the battery full. So we realized we could have easily gone to Corsica, even all the way to the south end of Sardinia um, because we had a north wind, but I was uh, a bit, worried about flying across the ocean. So we were very chicken on the first flight, but this was the entire expedition. Um, there was one day missing for a thunderstorm that you'll see about later. 
So um, let me just show you. When we started, we didn't have very good conditions. We had the low cloud bases. And uh, in the Apennines, it can be really no place to land if you have a power failure or can't uh, find lift. So we're definitely not that comfortable in the mountains. And even at cloud base, you're still barely making it over the ridges. But at this point, I'm looking for this kind of an opportunity where I can go full full throttle with my motor and go right up here where my mouth, do you see my mouth circling here? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I need the climb rate because sometimes I've, I, I prefer not to have to turn back or fly in the clouds, but the idea is to go over the clouds. And the rest of the day, we had no more cloud problems because we were on top. So we're heading directly for Elba and we come to this interesting mine for marble just over town of Massa. It's uh, amazing uh, industry there and you'll see more about that on our way back. So this here is Massa Airport, one of our emergency landing possibilities. It's only a grass strip right across the street from the ocean. And we ended up landing there on our way back. So you'll see more about that later too. This is the airport at Pisa, famous for the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And setting off shore. This, these pictures remind me that I need to paint black uh, this inside of this railing here. It's ruining my pictures with these reflections. And yes, here's my wife uh, bravely watching the navigation as we go offshore. So I'd like, uh, yeah, this is P Piombino. Correct. Right. And then the beginning of Elba here. So we had our life jackets ready, but I wanted to point out that just for flying over the ocean, I installed an emergency propeller brake. This is a hydraulic bicycle brake which oh, yeah. in case of a complete power failure, because I always try to keep land within gliding range. However, if, uh, if I have a power failure, the propeller will keep windmilling and it creates a lot of drag. So with this hydraulic brake, I can stop the propeller even without electricity and then become a very good glider again. So this was installed just for the ocean flights. But if I remember time. correctly, the propeller feathers when it's not when it's it, not turning. It the correct term is it folds. Feathering oh. is different. Feathering is, is it not folds like this. Yeah, uh, folds back. So anyway, we're headed out to sea and coming to the island of Elba. You can see Corsica here in the distance which is always covered with this whipped cream on top, which is one reason we were worried about getting there late in the day because it's a lot of overdevelopment on Corsica. So approaching this beautiful island, very clear water and the harbor. And here's the airport. It's really the only place you could possibly land. There's no outlanding possibilities anywhere on Elba. And they gave us a uh, very nice hangar for the night. <laughs> and the next morning, uh, there was still north wind. And I, we had to take off into this downdraft. There is a wind, north wind blowing right over this hill. And uh, it, uh, I was thinking I might have to sneak through some low point, but we were able to climb fast enough. And we tried some soaring on the north side of Elba, but we really didn't get very high. And we were thinking we were much higher the day before. So we're actually starting quite low for our crossing, but uh, it was no problem. Here you can see Corsica coming. But um, at, when we left Elba, we couldn't even see Corsica. It was just haze in the distance, but uh, it feels funny to fly a a glider like this out over the ocean, but it was no problem. Now the problem is clouds. So we made it to 
um, the middle of the north. There's an airport right here. This is Corte. And uh, you'll, we landed, this was our departure airport that we chose to leave from when we returned. You'll see more of Corte later. Um, we wanted to land by the ocean though and go for a swim. We didn't want to be in the hot desert. So we had to cross the highest peaks of Corsica. And this was really tricky because the clouds and mountains were meeting together and we had to just uh, sneak through. But once we're on the other side, it was beautiful. Um, and what's interesting on Corsica has wonderful soaring conditions, but you have all these different layers. You can see here, one cloud base is here, high, and on the other side is a much lower cloud base, but they have sea breeze convergences on all sides. It's, it's wonderful because the wind blows always on shore during the summertime from all directions. And it's really good soaring. There is a glider club. Um, I've been there on the ground, but um, this is where we landed for the first day. This is Pro Propriano. Propiano. Propiano. Yes. yes, wonderful place. And you can go swimming right there at the airport. And here I am, um, actually, I think I'm putting the wings on the next day. And our, our driver brought the drone, so we got some air-to-air -air pictures over the ocean. Very beautiful. That looks like a model airplane. It's so small. Yeah, the funny thing was that to get to town, because we went to a restaurant and actually stayed in a hotel the first night, and that we had to swim across this part. That's the only way. It's much too far to go the other direction. So, but I was able to swim with all of our luggage across there. So it's funny that it had that. So the, uh, at, yeah, after a few days of flying on Corsica, we went to Corte and the funny thing was we had to send our, we had a, our camper van following us along, but because of the so few ferries, we had to, um, send the van ahead of us. If the van left before the airplane, so we were committed. We were alone. So that, this is after the water. These are the waterproof covers we use overnight. So he took the covers. We don't fly with these, and we had very interesting conditions, as you can see. There was Eric. Thermals. One one quick question from one of our listeners. Yeah. They want to know. So did you charge at night the batteries every night, more or less, and you? You started with ne the, or you used the solar? We never charged, not once. We, we didn't even have uh, the opportunity. None, none of the airports offered us electricity. Um, no, we, we never charged. And so tell we, us in the morning, what, what kind of yes. power did you have available from, uh, from your pack, from your batteries? Um, it was always, um, well, okay. That's an interesting question because uh, it's not healthy for the lithium batteries to fill them up to 100% or to run them down to 0%. The, the lithium batteries are the happiest between 20% and 80%. So for a big flight, like crossing the ocean, naturally I charge them 100%. But um, we charge them on the ground from the solar panels. As soon as the wings are attached, we get several kilowatts just sitting on the ground. So, but we never plugged the airplane in on any trip yet. We've never had to use the charger, but we would need, uh, you know, a extension cord and it's not convenient. So anyway, um, yeah, the strategy is to gain as much altitude inland as possible with thermals. And I actually, I take my time, like I stay on Corsica until I'm at cloud base and the batteries are full. So I have all the energy I could dream of. I'm, I'm up high altitude, batteries are full, time to go over the ocean. And How many kilowatt hours do you have when it's full? 
I have eight kilowatt hours. Thank you. Eight. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, running the motor at um, 16 kilowatts, so that would translate to 30 minutes. So that that means almost 200 kilometers distance uh, at the same level. Um, 200. Yeah. What we we had to make a flight last year in Switzerland at sunset, so there was no sun, and it was let me think 80 miles. That was 120. Actually. The, the the number I gave you was from when the batteries were new, and the batteries are not new. So mm -hmm. I think that it's less now. Okay. Yeah, we made uh, we were at a event in Switzerland last year, and we had to we were flying back. Or I was I was actually delivering the airplane from Volgera to Osopo. And I went to Switzerland, the north of Switzerland first. And it took me two and a half days from basically Bern, north of Bern, Bern Switzerland, to Osopo. But I had a, a headwind. And yeah, the first day, no sun. And it was 80 miles. So it's, I think, 120 kilometers. Maybe just, 130. Just, maybe, maybe yeah. Maybe 130. Yeah, just on batteries. But anyway, the... The big, the biggest airport on Corsica is right here. This is ba Bastia, I think. You call it. Bastia, yeah. yeah, yeah, right here, the runway. I was looking for a better picture. So this, this is an island uh, I looked at carefully because you could land on this. It's flat, but I can't imagine what the retrieval would be like because there's not even a, a ferry. But uh, here's Elba over here, and I can tell you. There's no outlining possibilities anywhere on Elba, just the ocean or the airport. So, and several of the other islands look like this also between off of uh, Pisa. Um, it's just, I think one of them is actually Monte Cristo, and it's one of my favorite movies, The Count of Monte Cristo. I flew over his his island where that treasure was found. So. <laughs> Where, I don't know if you've seen that movie, but there is an island, Monte Cristo. I, I wonder if there's any still any gold coins out there, probably. So we're trying to fly from Corsica to Voghera, and it's uh, looking, looking pretty good. But the further north we go, it's more and more of this piled up whipped cream and... Uh, we were told there was a big thunderstorm the next day, some low pressure coming through. So I, I don't like going under and going over. It, it, you know, you look at some spaces here and you say, yeah, it's possible, but it just uh, blossoms up and I've been trapped sometimes. I don't like getting trapped on top. So we decided to stop at Massa. Here's the airfield we had plenty of altitude, as you can see. So this was, we stayed uh, two nights because of this thunderstorm. And I had these waterproof covers and the airplane was overnight here just behind the trees. And this big thunderstorm was coming the next day, but I told my wife, don't worry, the thunderstorm will only be over the mountains. The thunderstorm will not come to the beach. Oh, yeah, this was uh, breakfast the second day, but the thunderstorm made a direct hit and it was breaking branches off of trees and fantastic wind directly from the mountains. But luckily, the friendly pilots at Massa let us hide the airplane at the last minute in this hangar, otherwise it would have been destroyed. And I can tell you from my reception on Corsica, there was an empty hangar at um, um, Propriano, yeah, Propriano, but um, they would not let us use the hangar, even if there was a thunderstorm. So I'm, I was happy to be back on friendly Italian soil because they really saved my airplane. It, it even got wet in the hangar, it was so windy. You can see but, it. 
Yeah, <laughs> this was just oh. a crazy, crazy thunderstorm I have never seen. And they said it never happens, but. And, and we were there specifically to avoid the thunderstorm. But uh, anyway, one day later, I'm um, taxiing down their taxiway to take off. And here I'm ready to take off from almost sea level on grass and climb up this amazing quarry. It was really interesting watching how they cut the stone. I, I suppose Masa, this area is famous for this white marble. Um, all of the, the sidewalks and benches in the town were made from this material. It was really, and it was some interesting soaring conditions here because of very, very low cloud bases, but further inland, you can just see it's just little one bridge back and it's much higher. So I actually, my strategy here was I needed to um, just stay here for at least 30 minutes just to recharge my batteries so that I could reach the Apennine. So, but it was a wonderful view of both the ocean and mountains and clouds. And finally, I set out for the Apennines. So do you mean in about half an hour uh, of level flight, you can recharge the batteries uh, of the amount you have used for launching? Uh, no, the, the motor is off. As soon as I find a cloud or even, you know, just zero sync, oh, yeah. I've turned on, I'm only recharging the batteries when the motor is off. So half an hour with the engine off is enough to no, recharge from, after launch? Yes. That's quite efficient. Well, if, yes. Well, no, if the batteries are completely empty, it's closer to an hour, but it really depends on the day and the altitude because at 3,000 meters, for example, it's much faster. The sun is much more powerful. The colder the solar panels are, the more electricity they produce. So my favorite altitude is at least 3,000 meters. So anyway, we're yeah back on the Apennines. And this is the point where I'm actually on final glide back to Voghera, so obviously the cloud bases were much better when we returned than when we started. So, and here I am back home. There's Dino, airport manager. I don't know if anybody knows Voghera and Dino, but there he is. So now I'm gonna give a little background about myself. I um, uh, started out with model airplanes, first uh, plastic scale models mostly from Second World War, and then radio controlled models. Here's a glider with a little motor on top, but I was always designing things. You can see me here. This is how we used to do drawings with this big drafting board a long time ago. So I started flying myself with hang gliders in 1974, and I actually built my first one from plans and then I switched to rigid wing hang gliders. And uh, this one I built and I actually set the world distance record on it, which is the last time a homemade hang glider set the distance record. It's been production ever since. And I, this was another one I designed, which had all composite spars already in 1985. These are carbon fiber spars, but I still used a lot of wires. Now they have eliminated almost all the wires. Did you also build the spars? Yes, yes, I molded these. This was in England at Airwave Gliders on the Isle of Wight. So you, you got some FAI records with these gliders? No, the, uh, it, I, I had an FAI sporting license yeah. But it was very difficult um, in California because we had to um, uh, file the documentation within 24 hours and the in the office in Washington, D.C., and it would be closed by the time we landed. And anyway, it became so difficult that I gave up on the FAI 
a long time ago. And with the solar powered airplanes, it's an entirely different story that I'm not going to tell because for most of my career, there was no category for solar powered aircraft. But let me, yeah. yeah, it was, uh, yeah, uh, P Pier Luigi Dorante from Torino. Um, he was the FAI representative. Um, trying to make the rules for solar powered aircraft. And the rule was that a solar powered aircraft could not carry a battery. And I carried batteries, so my airplane was not solar powered. But the modern definition now accepts batteries. So um, back to my story. In 1983, I started coming to the Alps and I discovered what a wonderful place it is flying in Switzerland. And this was, I really decided where I wanted to be flying. And it's a wonderful community, a lot of enthusiasm. You can tell this, this pilot's obviously French by this cartoon. And this was in Chamonix, Mont Blanc. Uh, but we were just flying every day. I never went to any museums or anything, just fly, 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 cross country. And I was doing a lot of photography, which wasn't so easy back then. These cameras are heavy and the glider is sensitive to weight so if this falls off i would need to use my parachute it's such a big apparatus to fly with and i discovered that it was easy to land on top of the mountains with the hang glider and i had my camping supplies inside here you can see this this shadow um, so i found a lot of interesting places to land and uh, like this is a very high mountain where I was able to land and I could spend the night in my little tent. And later a Swiss pilot took up the challenge. This is Didier Favre, a Swiss champion. And he eventually made it from Monaco through the French Maritime Alps, French all the way to Yugoslavia, right near where I live and he wrote a book about this and this has become popular now for the um, parapent paragliders are also flying and camping so but I was uh, doing that and a lot of photography and I developed the method of towing my camera just with these ropes here it's the only way it's attached and eventually I made uh, I did a loop with the cameras only supported by these ropes here, which uh, is really something to think about the night before. Hum, heavy camera flying over me somehow on strings. So I didn't sleep well the night before, but you can see that it worked. And in the same year, we had the first aerobatic competition in Monaco. And I actually stipulated that it must be over the ocean and it doesn't this is me diving for to do a loop and it doesn't look like it but i'm actually over the mediterranean i'm not over these houses but um, the pictures were taken from a helicopter so it's deceptive and this was when i discovered just how good the german zeiss lenses are you could count my shoelaces from one kilometer away I was very impressed with the quality of this photographer, Alain Guillaume, French Perimatch photographer. So now I'm going to describe the history of these electric aircraft because they're actually not new. Um, as you can see, this is a, a motor glider that uh, flew successfully, and I just discovered a a link to the video and it's clear to me that already you could make something here you can see the batteries and the um, brush type motor turning a reduction drive so the, you have this large diameter propeller and uh, for 1973 this was actually pretty efficient and there's a, I found a video um, where you can actually see the first flight so it's would have been already possible with nickel cadmium batteries to reach soaring height, um, in my opinion. So it's just everything's just been getting better and better as far as the technology goes. 
and a lot of the technology came from the human-powered aircraft. Um, this is uh, Paul McCready's Gossamer Condor being flown by Brian Allen, who I think is watching right now. It's from his house on the California coast. And this led to this remarkable airplane, the Paul McCready Solar Challenger, which flew from Paris to London in 1981. And it had no batteries and even no electronics. Um, the solar energy peak power tracker was a mechanical variable pitch propeller and the pilot would just vary the pitch of the propeller until he found the sweet spot. So this was what really got me excited. I was already, I was interested in 1979, but I was very excited in 1981. And you can um, see the food. Yes. Uh, Eric, some, Brian says uh, it was the Gossamer Albatross, not Condor. Is it no. possible? No? I, no, that is, I believe that's the, uh, the albatross had a much higher aspect ratio. Shame. And uh, there's one question regarding- You might the... be right, but I thought this was the albatross. No, I think the albatross had the wings swept back a little more, so he might be right, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, there is a question. It might be relevant at the moment. Why did you choose the fin position for the engine on your sun seeker instead of a front propeller, as we've seen in other uh, in other aircraft in this presentation, like this one, like the solar? Um, well, um, the main reason is I want is I wanted myself and my passengers to be as comfortable as possible, and I don't like the noise because. Believe it or not, electric motors can be very loud, um, especially if there's a, a gearbox or something. But um, I wanted the motor as far from the cockpit as possible. But when you have a big fat fuselage, you don't want the propeller on the front. You want the propeller to have nothing in front of it and as much as nothing as possible behind it. So, but you'll actually, you'll see some more just a little bit later when I move ahead. But thank you, Brian, for correcting me. I'm gonna actually check. I guess Brian knows these pictures since, I think this is from Taurus Kasenik's collection, but yeah, maybe, huh, okay. Well, moving along. Er, well, Eric, we... one question. Uh, do you have sure. any preference between pushing propeller and pulling propellers? Do you think there is a, Quite a. Uh, what's the the rationality of choosing one against another, or efficiency, or anything else? Okay. So you'll notice that uh, torpedoes are very very fast. I'm sure you've heard that. And torpedoes have the propeller in the back. And for an airship, for example, that's the very best place is a pusher propeller in the back. Um, Paul McCready. Even one time when I was at um, lunch with him, he told me that he, a propeller on an airship on the back could be more than 100% efficient. And that's because it's re-energizing the boundary layer. So for a fat body, it's actually better. But on my single seater, I had the propeller behind the tail and it made a lot of vibration because the propeller is hitting the turbulence from all three tail surfaces. So um, I'll, I'll explain more about that just a little bit later. So, but let me keep that question in mind when I have a better picture in front of me. I will remind so, you. Yeah. So yeah, I've been I've been researching that topic quite a lot because um, this propeller you see here, you can even see they make marks showing the way it rotates. So there's a swirling turbulent um, airflow. And when it strikes the wing and this vertical fuselage, it actually regains some energy because these act as uh, straighteners for the airflow. So it increases the propeller efficiency to have these behind the propeller. So I, it's, it really depends on the exact installation, also the center of gravity. Um, for example, this pilot doesn't have 
such a good view because he's under the wing. And if the motor was in the back, the pilot would need to be further forward to balance the airplane and then the pilot would have a better view. So I like to have the motor in the back so that the people can be in front of the wing and they get the perfect view. Because if you can picture this pilot turning in a thermal, he doesn't see the other gliders. He's blind. His wing is always blocking his view. And, and I hate flying gliders where I'm under the wing. I, there's been some two-seaters, uh, like a Schweitzer 233, where the back seat can't see you in a turn. So I'll get back to that. So working with Paul McCready's group, um, this is actually the designer of the Solar Challenger, right here, Ray Morgan. And here, this is this is an ultralight sailplane that we eventually put uh, gasoline motor on. I, but I flew this as a glider in competition. It was a, a folder folding glider that actually had some military applications later on. But um, I was also had the honor of flying the human powered airplanes. Um, this one built by Paul McCready. Um, uh, named the Bionic Bat. And this is actually a hybrid. It also had an electric motor that the pilot would store his energy in nickel cadmium batteries. But I had to figure out this control system where you're using your feet only for pedaling. And these would be in effect the rudder pedals, except that they are reversed. And after learning this, I realized that all of our gliders and airplanes, we they got the control correct, except for the rudders, I believe. And I've, I've been a sailplane instructor for many years, and I've noticed how hard it is to teach people the rudder. And I believe the rudder is reversed. And a little more on that later. So, oh, this was a human-powered airship uh, built by one of uh, Paul McCready's co-workers and test flown by Brian Allen. Also, he even set a cross-country record on this airship, but this would be a perfect candidate for having the propeller at the back. That would be the most efficient place. You certainly would not put the propeller on the front of this. That would be terrible. Just to talk about propeller location. So it really depends on the aircraft. But uh, this was the airplane that really changed my life. This is a German hu human-powered airplane with a completely cantilevered laminar flow wing. And the whole airplane only weighed 24 kilograms. And it was stressed for three Gs. So uh, Gunter Rachel let me fly it. And here I am trying to figure out the controls. You imagine that you're holding the wings. So you twist the wing, twist it forward for down, twist it back and roll and then yaw. As I said, you yaw this the same way you would want to yaw the airplane, which is exactly the opposite of a rudder bar. If anyone remembers when before rudder pedals, they just had a simple bar, but this is hooked up backwards. So it becomes really difficult if you already know how to use rudders that now the rudder is reversed so but i think this this method is correct but it's too late to change aviation now so our feet work the way they do so yeah this is me flying the muscular 2 in canada at uh, expo 86 and i was just amazed that this could go 50 kilometers an hour at the oh, one third of a horsepower. So it immediately inspired me to try to build my own solar powered airplane using Gunter Rachot's technology. And he actually helped me. He gave me airfoils and he gave me a lot of advice. And this is the airplane that I built. It was about 45 kilograms uh, when it first flew. This is just as a glider, no propeller, no motor no solar cells and we were towing it you can see tow hook under the nose here getting used to it and then i put on these amorphous solar cells and this is how i flew it across the united states in the summer of 1990.
here's yeah here's a map showing the stops and i also mounted cameras on it this is a 70 millimeter film camera on a very long boom obviously i had to be careful flying with this but i could get the whole wingspan in which is now easy of course with the modern gopros but it wasn't so easy in 1990 with film cameras so we we made our own uh, molds for the fuselage from styrofoam sheets uh expert uh, taught me how to use water lines and how to shape the foam so that uh i had to imagine myself inside this solid thing that i would have enough room and here it is with the wing and the tail boom and these are the you can see the molds in the background here and the shells the back part um was uh, uh, ejectable for a ballistic parachute and it also was fiberglass because it was a radio antenna in the very back part vertical antenna well there you can see this is a load carrying shell there was internal bulkheads but it's not just a non-structural fairing i was originally going to make it non-structural but the internal structure took up too much space so i made it load carrying with the seat and other bulkheads so the wing was built up with many many ribs and uh, i had d-cell batteries inside this foam tube here in the leading edge so these were nickel cadmium batteries from sanyo and there was no mold for the wing the skin was hand bent around you can you can see the ribs showing there and also the tail the advantage being that there's no seam at the leading edge this was also balanced with d cell batteries in the leading edge this is the all moving vertical stabilizer and you can see how the elevator worked it's just cut from the original surface and made into a control surface so here's the first sun seeker ready for its flight across the United States. Oops. And here it is in Chanute, Kansas, on my trip across. And this was actually in New Mexico, coming into Lordsburg. We had some really big thunderstorms in the deserts. Here I am landing with one of my ground crew bravely on the runway, Kenji Bamba. So I rebuilt the airplane later with lithium polymer batteries. Um, these are the four packs that I initially flew with, with proper battery management system. And with this and the new solar cells made it into a truly solar powered airplane. And I rebuilt the instrument panel with every device I could think of for cross-country flights and even I had my hang gliding variometer as a backup here in case something went wrong so I'm going to show a little bit about my dramatic crossing of the Alps um, the weather wasn't so good but I brought the ground crew from the United States to follow me um, this was part of a big European tour expedition and here I am ready to go on the runway and headed for the Alps, which seem to go on forever. Those wingtips touching the ground, I guess you were able to put them in a straight level position during flight? Yes, um, before I- Straight level. Before I, yes, uh, there's, they're just held down by cables and they're spring loaded and then locked although the locking mechanism didn't always work and sometimes they would flap down a little bit so i wasn't completely happy with them but they acted as outriggers but it was awfully wide so i had to look out for runway lights and i always had to try to because sometimes the wind would tip me from one side to the other it wasn't it wasn't the perfect solution i prefer three wheels not four like this so Yes, this is an outrigger system. So headed for the Alps and 
eventually I got to where I could go over the clouds and then the clouds rose up and actually, I actually started snowing. I couldn't understand it. I was in bright sunshine, but there was snow coming in my air vent and I had to make a 7,000 foot spiral descent. And I really was depressed at losing all my altitude. But once I got below the clouds, it was no problem. And I continued on to Torino. And from Torino, I continued down to Sicily. And then one of my ground, uh, you're going to see more about that later. And eventually later in 2009, I tried to go to North Africa, but the west wind was just killing me. You could see every day my flight got bent back. And this was the last day where I just could not, could not penetrate. Um, I think, I think we, it was a good idea that we didn't go to Gibraltar because it's so windy in the summertime. It's perfect for windsurfing, but not so perfect for slow solar-powered airplanes. So. Um, which is your wind charge? Wing loading. To, uh, wind loading. Uh, uh, okay, that's a good question. Well, let's see. Three pounds. Uh, it's. I'm. I know it in American units. Three. Three. Three pounds per square foot. Three pounds. Uh, Yes. I'll do the conversion for you while you're speaking. Okay. Um, so yes, after the European tour, I've been flying it uh, many, many times, even did some loops just to prove that it's airworthy. But now I'm going to talk about where came the Sunseeker Duo. Um, Eric and uh, all. The equivalence is uh, three pounds per square foot equals less than 15 kilograms per meter square. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 15, less than 15. So the first glider, I was originally, I wanted to make a two seater for a long time, but I noticed that the back seat would always be under the wing and the wing is big with solar panels on it. So I noticed uh, this wonderful side-by-side -side Caproni and uh, this was my first inspiration. Um, the other thing was the German University Stuttgart developed this nice solar airplane and they actually lent me the molds for both the wing and the tail. So other than I made molds for my winglets, but this is the same wing. They had 25 meter wingspan. And uh, since I had better solar cells, I reduced it to less than 22 meters. But the, the tail and the wing are basically the same. Um, actually, I added um, full flaps on the trailing edge and I modified the airfoil slightly so I can go a little bit faster when I put the flaps negative but it's um, the wing was designed by university stuttgart and they also designed this airplane which is not solar but it's battery powered and you can see the motor location is on the tail because they don't want anything in front of the propeller or behind and i was actually invited to fly this in um, competition in california this is me with my friend Carl Kayser getting ready for the NASA's Green Flight Challenge, which we took second place in. Pipistrel won with a uh, Siamese twin version of their Taurus motor glider. And here we're flying at a, at a NASA base, flying with one of the engineers. But you can see this, this is really a perfect place for the motor because Many two-seaters, they have to have the wings swept forward. I'm sure you noticed that. And here we just have the perfect place to sit. We're in front of the wing. The wing never blocks our view. And we don't hear the, the motor very much because it's way back here. So there's your answer to the propeller location question. But uh, Eric, uh, is there any way that you could put the propeller, uh, since you say the uh, pusher propeller, like the torpedo would be maybe a, a more efficient one. Could you reverse and put it um, the back pushing it or is it too much work? 
Well, here it is right yeah. here. Right like right that, here. something like that. Well, this is much too close to the tail, much okay. too close um, because the propeller is losing efficiency because it's actually almost stalling every time it flies behind one of its, every revolution it hits the wake three times. It's oh. terrible. It has to be much further back. And I learned that lesson and on my single seater, I put a big extension and moved it back, but uh, you get a loss of efficiency here. So this is a University of Stuttgart, 1996, and this is University of Stuttgart, um, 2000 and um, I don't know, 2007. And they obviously they moved the motor to the front. They could put the motor either place here and. The Germans are pretty good engineers, so I tend to respect their decisions. You know, uh, a lot of uh, pilots are fascinated by V-tails. Is there anything you can tell us about your experience uh, if V-tail is something that it could be something interesting to look at, or is it a surpass idea from the past, or what are the advantages? Did you say V? v yeah, like a V-tail. A lot of yeah. uh, advanced... No, uh, no, there's no... No advantage at all. Okay. It's, in fact, it 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 uh, it's got some big disadvantages. Um, and uh, the, uh, one of my friends was even killed on a V tail made in China, Martin Weasel, um, because when you make a big rudder input, you get a very much torsion on the tail boom, and my single seat um, Sunseeker. This one here, find a normal picture of it. Well, anyway, here it looks like it's right side up. But with this arrangement, you actually get a positive torsion, but you want to minimize. That's why um, a lot of airplanes like this one, we try to put the rudder some below the tail boom to reduce the twisting. You know, the, the elevator doesn't twist the tail boom, but the rudder can twist the tail boom. And on a V-tail, it's twice as bad. So I don't recommend V-tails for anything. Nothing. I'm sorry. So the other inspiration was obviously the STEMI S10, which seems like a natural um, step up from the Caproni, which had the similar cockpit. And Dr. Stemi, uh, I spoke with him already in 1998, and he agreed in principle to let me use the molds. And this was in 2007, I believe. And here is a chart showing the progression. These are Gunther Rachelt. He made a solar powered airplane that I didn't mention which led to my Sunseeker and then the Caproni led to the STEMI and the Ikare. So this pretty much shows, and the E-Genius was slightly before the Sunseeker duo. And actually this starts in 1980, but the Caproni was actually even in the 1970s, was a really good glider okay. a long time ago. So this, the Caproni, I just didn't have enough space, but the Caproni should be the father of all of these, I suppose, at least before. Just to give the Italians proper credit, it's a pity Caproni doesn't make gliders anymore. And there's some amazing modern jet engines, too. They had the, quite a good jet-powered glider, I'm sure you know. Did Eric, did, did uh, Mr. Stemme, uh, Dr. Temmet ever mention to you about approaching Caproni in the 70s to ask them if they wanted to do a, a glider together? Because I heard a rumor from inside from an engineer that he kind of not stole the idea, but because Caproni said no, and then Stemme became Stemme, thanks to the idea of Caproni. I, I don't know. I just, okay. he, was okay. in, he was in East Germany and it was very difficult, um, but uh, even to get out. It's okay. it's okay. I just wanted to know if you mentioned anything. Sorry, I, I took it off course. Go, go ahead with your presentation. No, um, 
I never, well, you know, there's, there's other, there's an amazing, there's an American glider made for training in World War II called a Pratt Reed that has the same cockpit side by side. So the Caproni cockpit's not the, the first, it's probably the first really good one, but I don't know. I uh, can't really answer that. So um, this is molding the uh, tail boom. Um, it's actually the STEMI is not a one piece fuselage because of the Rotax engine in the middle, but it worked out perfectly for me um, because I needed to put my batteries and landing gear and control system in here. So I wanted to build, oops, I didn't mean to do that. The STEMI um, has a steel frame there That's, in, in yeah. the hole, in the missing part of the fuselage, holding yeah. the engine and et cetera. Yeah. yeah. So and I think landing, you yeah. used composites. Yes, um, theirs is bolted together, although I've rarely seen them ever unbolt. I've never seen them. I mean, they do disassemble airplanes, but mine is permanent. I made square carbon tubes and I, um, just bonded them in and they're very well um, laminated in. But I also added half a meter. I stretched the fuselage because I wanted more space for the people to lie back and sleep. So I, I also had to move the tail boom up so that I had the correct aerodynamic relationship because this is sloping down too much. And there would be airflow separation. So the I had to move the tail boom up and back and uh, is a bit of a compromise. But um, anyway, here it is back in Slovenia. My wife and I just testing it out. And uh, we do a lot of mock-ups with plywood. These are the actual uh, original STEMI control system, the sticks and everything. I flew with STEMI rudder pedals and a lot of original STEMI parts that I bought from their parts department. And here I am with, these are all people from University of Stuttgart that uh, helped me quite a bit. And we're trying to figure out, this is representing the frame and the push rod for the elevator is already installed. Uh, this had to be installed very early on, but we're trying to figure out the landing gear here, which is not easy because I wanted tricycle landing gear and it hadn't been done before. So here we are trying to mock it up with what's actually the nose wheel. So the sliding window uh, was something I wanted to make separate for each person. And I had to make an entirely new fiberglass mock-up uh, with the frame and everything and figure out how this would work because these railings are bending in all directions and it's impossible for me to calculate or imagine. But um, anyway, these are the batteries I used. Uh, there's 90 cells. These are okay. the lithium polymer from Cocam. And these are, they're in six boxes and they're on a sliding track. So I can even move them in flight. I can adjust the position of the batteries and the batteries, they don't get any cooling other than the there's an airspace between these. Not, not so much as you see here, but this is the correct gap here. And uh, we just, uh, I can let some airflow over the batteries, but um, this is uh, just showing one in the tail boom. And here you can see these are my static ports, these on the sides of the tail boom, where I have the plastic tubing. And here is the main fuse. I think it's uh, 100 or I forget 100 or 200 amps and batteries ready to be closed. So there's three of the three of the modules. And with this is the battery management system that um, keeps the batteries balanced. And uh, this was a test fit uh, early on, but you can see it's very, very close. Um, this is in the rear position and this is in the front position. So when I'm flying solo, um, 
I have the batteries all the way forward, and with a passenger, I move them back. Impressive. How? What's the total mass of the batteries? Uh, the cells are 45 kilograms, and it's only about 3% more uh, packaging. I have very low packaging weight, so less than 50 kilograms. This is uh, laminating the bottom skin on the wing. Um, I It's in the top mold but uh, we didn't the molds are much too heavy to bring the bottom mold over and i had to make um custom molds for the center section and this is my wife putting um nomex honeycomb over the prepreg and whoops these are out of order here sorry um i didn't uh, this is cutting the carbon fiber for the wing spar caps um this is a big roll of carbon prepreg, and ah, okay, I thought I had these in better order. But this is Roman Sushnik, who makes the motors for Pipistrel, and he makes very, very good direct drive motors. And I plan, I put the motor, I could have put it back at the fan or up at the spinner, but I decided to put it exactly halfway, so the motor goes right here, and. Um, the power wires actually run through, this is just a mock-up of this um, dorsal fin here. Um, so this is all just in the early stages. My wife uh, did all of the connecting of the solar cells and we laminated them into these large panels and vacuum bagged them into the wing molds to build the wing skins. With the, you see we have three freezers here. This is where we stored all of our carbon prepreg. The, almost the entire airplane is made from prepreg, which is um, composite materials that already have the epoxy built in in the right ratio, and it requires an oven to cure it. So here's the horizontal stabilizer. And this is actually the wing doesn't even have the bottom surface on here. This is just an early test where you can see the nose gear, but the main gear doesn't exist yet. And we are just doing some test fitting. Ah, yeah, here you see the wing with some skin on and some skin not on, and you can see the separate flap. So, Eric, one of our uh, viewers is asking about cope. Coke hams. Um, I don't know what it are. This is uh, somebody, it might be somebody um, actually involved in electric uh, engine, mm -hmm. Lucas. So do you know what? Yeah. Um, Aldo, maybe you want to? Coke ham is the very best lithium polymer batteries. It's it's the most popular and they, they're from South Korea. They're really good batteries. Are you happy with them? Would you choose them again or? Well, what is the, the status nowadays with the batteries? The status is that Kokem was bought by, Kokem is a South Korean company, but they were purchased by an American company and the American company decided that they don't want to support any more manned aircraft. So they won't sell them for manned aircraft is the status of Kokem. Seen it already. Many fields, mm -hmm. engines, and so on. But unmanned aircraft, no problem. And military, no problem. So of course. You can kill people as long as uh, you're in the military, I guess. Sir. But you can't. Especially from anyway, that's, that's, that's another subject. So this is, this is the carbon prepreg being applied. Um, I think, yeah, this is the first layer going onto the mold. Yeah, the mold is painted gray. And then this is the Nomex honeycomb that forms the, um, we do this in two cure cycles so that we can remove this tape and fill any gaps. And then we put another layer of carbon fiber. We, and this we have received a very technical question about the curing. What temperature was necessary for curing? Uh -huh. Well, um, these molds are all um, just styrofoam. And uh, they can only resist 100 degrees centigrade, maybe 
two degrees more, but even the 105, they get destroyed. So we had to use a very low, this is a centigrade. Um, we used exactly 100 degrees centigrade and we had to use many, many hours because it's better to use 120, but this is a mold made from styrofoam. And did you also yeah. use prepregs? Yes, yes. That's why, yeah. This this yeah. here is just simple styrofoam. Okay, here. and the prepregs, what temperature did you use? 100 degrees centigrade. Okay, okay. For yeah, the prepregs, okay. Yes, it's, yes, the, it's it's a special prepreg. It's low temperature. It's the resin system is the the key, and the resin system was designed to cure at 100 degrees centigrade. Um, at uh, it's like at least four hours. So we I would sleep in the workshop, but yeah, here you can see this is carbon prepreg. There's no, you'll see there's no uh, cups of epoxy, no nothing dripping down, but there's epoxy already in the carbon fiber. You see it's, it's shiny here. And when you heat it up, it bonds to the honeycomb. So, and here it is, uh, the, yeah, anyway. And here is the finished part uh, ready to come off. And we, yeah, we cut this into two halves, um, but uh, it was molded in one piece. So the main landing gear it was actually intended to be welded titanium, but uh, it uh, I could not buy the small quantities of the titanium tubing, so I decided to make them also out of carbon prepreg. And they're a little bit bigger than the titanium design, but um, uh, they been strong enough um, for all situations. So it's finally painted and ready to go to the airport. We never did fly it in Slovenia because we could not get um, a hangar anywhere in Slovenia. So we had to go to Italy. And that's when we discovered Bulgaria and we first flew it uh, without the motor. Just one day we flew it um, just towing it down the runway. With a car, yeah. I suppose. Yes. Our yes. tow planes are too fast for the Sun Seeker, I guess. <laughs> yes, but we only needed to fly it down the runway, so it, the car was just perfect. So the propeller blades I made myself with um, these aluminum molds, custom made for this, and we first mold um, a foam core, also from Star Foam, and then we put in Prepreg, this is an aluminum fitting. It's a variable, I should say adjustable pitch, but it's just ground adjustable. We don't change the pitch in the air. So um, we, here it is, first blade with the aluminum fitting molded in. And so this is a prepreg propeller blade that we made. And the, cool, the motor controller required considerable cooling. Um, this is a strong fan that pulls the air the, the funny thing is the the propeller does not act as a very good cooling fan because there's very little airflow at the root ends of the propeller so the motor here doesn't receive any really propeller blast because the the propeller is more efficient at larger diameters so um, this was the very first flight where I retracted the nose wheel, but um, I did this in stages. I even had um, fairings over the openings for the main gear, but um, eventually we gained enough confidence to also retract the main wheels. But this was the first flight where I retracted anything here. And I made some flights um, where my wife flew the two-seater and I flew the single-seater so we could take some air-to-air -air pictures and like even this. though she was she was very very light but um i was still having trouble catching up with her in the older airplanes so um eventually we just stopped flying the single seater i'm sad to say and i just put it in a museum in germany but i'm happy that it 
and it's a nice safe home even though i miss my airplane is it ah. at the wasserkuppe museum no it's at a very nice technical museum in sinsheim which Sinsheim. near yes it's a uh, the museum on the roof of the museum are two supersonic transports the french concorde and the tupolev flying in formation and they have many many other aircraft um from second world war and jets and but it's a it's a technical museum with cars and submarines and I met the owner and he's he's an incredible color collector I I liked him very much so I'm very happy to lend him the airplane it's got a I'm nice publishing home. the link to that museum in the chat room uh -huh. oh, excellent technical yes. museum dot da yeah, and it's actually the museum is in two parts. Um, one part is in Sinsheim, and then there's another, uh, I can't even remember the name of the other town, but um, it's really, you need two days to see both museums, and there's airplanes at both, so. Heilbronn, the second town. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And it's yeah, it's, it's first, it's, it's maybe not, the best museum in Germany is the Deutsches Museum in Munich. But uh, Sinsheim is definitely worth seeing a lot of unique, and you can go in both of the supersonic transports. It's a wonderful museum. So I highly recommend it. And you'll see this airplane yeah. from both yeah. above and below. You can, so, okay, we saw that. Okay, oh uh, yeah, not, I'm not sure the order here, but yeah, we're, now I'm showing a cross country flight to Pavulo. Oh, no was um, a wonderful place to visit. Uh, okay, just some random pictures here. Ah, okay. This was an expedition to the Swiss Alps and we wanted to go to Torino first, but we had to go way around. And then the second day, um, I didn't, I wanted to go directly over the Matterhorn, but you, this this point here, I failed, and we had to go soaring again until the batteries were recharged fully. And on the second attempt, same day, we made it to the Alps. So this is taking off from Torino, and this was the very last part of the climb, where we're just trying to get. And the amazing thing is, this is in August, and there's so much snow in August. When, when you're living in Voghera, Italy, you can't imagine that there's ice and snow anywhere in the world. It's so hot. But um, believe me, there's a lot of snow in Switzerland. You must have been well above 3,000 meters. Yes, yes, we're near the Matterhorn. So, and I took my wife for a tour of all the glaciers. Um, we were so high and her, my wife's daughter was driving the camper van for us. We, we don't bring the trailer. We just, I, I trust the airplane to always return home. So we don't, we don't bring the trailer, but um, we had some wonderful flights over the Alec Glacier. And uh, I, I, that's my favorite place to fly is the high Alps in All of us, we love it. Yeah, it's so beautiful. So yeah, this is the Eiger and the Monch. In fact, yeah, this, this, I was taking my wife's daughter along for a sunset flight just before we went out to dinner. So and there it is again, the uh, Eiger and Monch from a different angle. So, okay, yeah, I guess I was gonna talk some about uh, the European tour or specifically, yeah, yes. I, uh, I have read a couple of, um, interesting technical questions from our participants okay and I'll interrupt you so yeah. um, well uh, um, Jean-Marie asks how you could and was it difficult to get a US experimental registration uh, while flying in Italy and building the aircraft in Slovenia and probably I guess the Sunseeker duo never visited the USA that's an interesting question. Um, well, 
Um, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Maybe it was a bit too interesting. <laughs> well, we have a uh, very professional designated airworthiness representative okay. who um, is empowered by the American FAA to give us an airworthiness certificate. And he also did the same thing for the e-genius before it came to the United States. We also okay. had the same thing. So he's he's done several aircraft for me. Oh, great. It was Somebody asked uh, if uh, the propeller in the position where it is mm -hmm. uh, uh, creates uh, turbulence and prop wash on the elevator and uh, vertical stabilizer and rudder. Uh, well, it it doesn't have very much power, and it's a it's a two meter diameter, so it's pushing a lot of air only a little bit. Lower speed, um, okay. Hmm. Uh, yes, it's it's not a very fast propeller. Um, it's less than fifty. It's a, yeah, actually at this altitude, it's about 15 or even 1600 RPM. Um, but uh, no, I, I don't notice anything. And if anything, it helps the rudder. Whereas when we had the propeller behind the tail, it was big trouble, big trouble because, and also on the ground taxiing because then the propeller fights the rudder. Here, the propeller helps the rudder. Like if you're taxiing on the ground and normally we steer with the nose wheel, but if you try to steer with your feet on the rudder pedals, the propeller is pushing air over the rudder and having the propeller behind the rudder, it's trying to fight against the rudder. It tries to straighten it out, so. Anyway, Thank you. Um, so I wanted to, show you some of my pictures from going down to Sicily because I really enjoy Italy and I have some fun questions. It's almost like a contest for your Italian <laughs> viewers, you'll see. Um, but yeah, we're gonna talk about, um, so this was going to, from Voghera to Pavulo. So I did it also in the single seater, but I have 20, you can't see probably very well, but there's an arrow here. I had a headwind or a almost crossing headwind of 22 knots. I think you have a picture of it later here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, here it is. Okay. 25 knots here. It says up here, headwind. Terrible. I'm, I'm just trying to fly to Sicily and I'm pointed in completely the wrong direction because of this, this terrible wind. So I just kept going higher and higher. And uh, of course the wind is stronger and stronger, but this was one of the first times that my ground crew arrived before me and they kept asking me if I was making it. And I just said, slowly, you know, I have 25 knot headwind, but I reached Pavulo and it was, uh, yeah, this is my very first time. Uh, this was in April, 2009, absolutely beautiful coming in there and the wonderful club they were very ah i wanted to use this opportunity this is my ground crew this is our camper van and uh this uh may or june i'd like to make an expedition down the coast of croatia with my wife and we're looking for volunteers to drive the van and i pay all of their expenses and they also get to go for local flights in the Sun Seeker Duo. So I just thought I'd mention this is what people need to drive. No trailer. We don't bring the trailer. So this is taking off uh, from Pavulo, and I wanted to go to Rieti this day. And uh, this, what's his name? Brigatoli? Brigliadori. Yeah, he had mentioned um, um, Guidonia that there was a glider club there. As an alternate, uh, yeah. Yes, and oh, yeah. that was very exciting. I was expecting to land in Rieti, which was grass, but we had weather like this, and uh, it was so black that, um... okay, so this is on the flight 
direct from Pavulo to Guidonia. There, the, the last, if you see here, my the last, this is Guidonia military, but I didn't know exactly. So what I'd like to ask your Italian viewers is if they can tell me what airport this is. This is somewhere between Pav south of Pavulo, and it has this very interesting hieroglyphics here. It looks like an Egyptian dog here. This is the ears and the face sitting with its feet forward. It's a motocross track for motorcycles. Uh -huh. Do you know what airport this might be? Uh, no. No, okay. I don't. Anybody well, know? Someone Someone can type in if they know, I'm just curious. So then here's another one. There's, you can't really see in this picture, but there's three glider trailers here. This was probably even more difficult, but this is a glider field right here. And then I came to this very large lake. Maybe you know what lake this is somewhere. Lake Bolsen, I think. And here's uh, airport right here. Exactly, yeah, that's right. So by the lake, I'm just curious if anybody knows these. Um, I know something people. about it. There was uh, in this one uh, at the at the lakeside, uh, there was a yearly meeting for ultralights. Oh. I don't remember the name of this place. I'm sorry. So help? Panicarola. I... Somebody said the Panicarola. Mauro Lorenzoni said the Panicarola, uh -huh. but it's not probably the one at the lake. Mauro, which one is was that? Maybe this? Or the uh -huh. one with the motocross? Mauro, which one is Panicarola? I would like to write one on the lake. Again. He says the one on the lake. Uh -huh. okay. okay, thank you, Mauro. Okay, well, if anyone figures out what those Trasimeno. others are, Lake Trasimeno, that's right. Lake so when I landed, it's I landed at Guidonia, and I was immediately met by military vehicles with large caliber guns. And they told me, no, this is not a glider field. This is a military. And right after they told me that, a two-seat Grobe 102 or 103 landed there. And I said, no, you said there's no gliders. And they said, oh, that's a local or something. Local you know? local club. Yes, there's a local club. And uh, I was I immediately arrested and questioned and um of course though they they recommended a good hotel and restaurant and they wrote they helped me write my excuse so that i could take off without paying any fine or anything the next day so they were super nice and friendly and the next day um i went to salerno but the weather was not very good i had a lot of clouds and even though I'm like, this is over about 2000 meters, I feel like I'm almost landing, you know, just uh, fighting my way through between the clouds and the mountains and rarely, almost no sun. You'll notice I'm, I'm in the shade. Ah, this was the day I learned why you don't wear a shirt this color. You see my shirt that I'm wearing? This is what it does to your photographs, so. Reflections. Don't, yes. Don't wear a shirt like this, or you get this. So. Lots of snow. Yes, in April. So yeah, it's sometimes I I felt lower than a snake's belly here. I just was thinking, how am I going to reach Salerno when I'm you know because I have no sun and no lift. I'm just looking for the wind blowing against anything so that I can just hang on and get a little bit further. And, uh, and then sometimes I have to go around, like here I have to go more left or right because this is just, um, I, I just felt like um, I was a hero when I finally reached Salerno. And I, I was not, the, and the airport had no activity. Here's Salerno Airport right here. Um, and there was no activity at all, um, no flights, but um, whoops, they, um, here I am coming in at Salerno, but um, they said that I needed, um, 
to announce myself 24 hours in advance. So there was a lot of questions. Yeah, no traffic and a lot of airspace. <laughs> yes. We are used so to it. They're following me. What are you doing? Where did you come from? So the next day was one of the most beautiful and amazing flights I've ever had because I flew along both coastlines. First, I had to start out with some difficult terrain again um, and no places to land. And I actually had to eventually go through this hole without really knowing what's on the other side. I was looking for a long time thinking, ooh, this, this looks like... But once I was through, I started the motor and I ended up, this is over Scalea. And it's, it's going from a straight line from Salerno to Crotone. I flew along both the West Coast and the inside of the Italian boot East Coast. So it was a beautiful flight, but I had to, you see all the clouds over the mountains. Here I was having my lunch at 10,000 feet, just over the ocean, wonderful. But I had to cross the mountains and this looked like my best opportunity. You see this pyramid shaped cloud here. Very interesting. It looked like this is the perfect place to go through, but I'm not in a jet fighter. I cannot reach this in five minutes. So I'm flying as absolutely as fast as I can with the motor, straight line, no turns. And you know how the clouds can be. As I'm approaching, it's looking like two giant fists closing in like a mouse trap closing on me. And my ground crew was asking me on the radio, you know, how I'm doing. And I said, I'm not sure. I don't know. And I'm just climbing, clouds are climbing, I'm climbing, and I can't see the other side, and I actually made a video in the middle, and this was a frame from the video where it was just exploding, but um, I made it through, and this is the view of where I came through, right through there, and Eric, after that, yes. Mauro has found uh, an answer for the first of the airport you have shown, the one with the motocross track. Ah. That's uh, Arezzo. Are, okay, I'm going to write that down. Arezzo. Okay, I know that name, but Arezzo. Okay, I'll look it up on a map. I would like yeah. to see that. They practice um, skydiving oh. as well as the local aero club. There used to be gliding activity. Ah. So here I'm headed That's for the other side of the ocean, but Crotone is still under this pile of whipped cream up here, as you'll see later. So I was very happy to be out of the Apennines um, and headed, headed for the coast here. But uh, I just told my ground crew, just I'm high, go to Crotone, I'll meet you in Crotone. And I was surprised to see it's not exactly the other side of Italy, but it's the inside of the Italian boot. So it's the uh, opposite coastline for me. And the problem was that more south I went, the more clouds. And eventually it became completely covered. And I decided to go on top because there's no more mountains. And I decided that if I got in trouble, I can just go out over the ocean and I should be able to get around the clouds. So it didn't look like it would be too turbulent. And I just usually don't like to go on top like this, but it was no problem. And it was even, I was looking back thinking, hum, maybe I should go back. See, I can still see planet Earth behind me here. But uh, I continued on top, and then I even found some wave conditions, some very mild uh, wave lift. This was really the end of Italy, Crotone, and uh, nice airport. I made some local flights there, and then headed for Sicily. And there was a north wind, but for some reason I decided not to go towards um, 
Palermo, I decided to go towards Syracuse. This is uh, Messina there. And very quickly, I was downdrafted more and more, losing altitude, really unhappy about this. You can see this is saying I have a eight knot wind from the side, but this really more than that because of the turbulence. And I'm just flying on the wrong side of Mount Etna here. I, I should have gone towards um, Palermo. I don't know yeah, why. You, you were following the eastern coastline of Sicily yes. with, uh, with an northerly wind, yeah. So going so down to Syracuse and Taormina probably. Yeah, yeah. Let's, so this was not a happy time right here and to be in a... I have many questions, but one from our participants is, uh, did you have big trouble with the ATC controllers? <laughs> Uh, no, I didn't talk to them. I okay. just went. So... Mauro, uh, Mauro informs us that probably the grass strip in the flatland could ah. be Torre Alfina. Torre. If it's uh, um, not too far from Rome, it's Torre Alfina where we have yeah. the National Aerobatic Gliding School. Really? Yeah, with Pietro Filippini. Okay, well, I'll look, I'll look on Google Earth and see if that's... Sore Alfina, yeah. And okay, I have yeah. a question for you, which is a more general question. Uh, your pictures are beautiful, and I particularly loved the ones in the mountains, and especially the ones in the Alpi Ap Apuane with the marble um, caves, mm. which, by the way, yeah are older than the Renaissance. Most of the most famous uh, sculptures and statues were built with that kind of marble. Wow, right that, from Massa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, do you, uh, I, uh, many people uh, ask themselves, uh, um, not today, but many people asked me the question, why did you do it? Why did you build these uh, aircrafts and uh, I, I, judging by your pictures, I would say you are doing it because you love to fly them, to fly them. Well, um, I, I learned to fly sailplanes in the United States when I was young, but I noticed that uh, we were very much tied to the tow plane and the home airport. So I like very much the idea of uh, self-launching, but I really do not like gasoline engines. Um, I, I wouldn't mind a little jet so much, except the fuel consumption and the air pollution and all that, but um, I don't like piston engines on gliders much at all. So when I flew the human-powered airplanes, it gave me the idea that um, you can I, I was really actually hoping that we would invent human powered airplanes. And um, yeah, Brian Allen was, was uh, involved with this. The bionic bat had batteries and I was thinking about um, a, a rubber band or spring or something that you could wind up even with your muscle power where you could get to soaring altitude without an electric motor. And I think that still could be possible to have a self-launching glider that has not even an electric motor. Just um, I, I actually built a large scale rubber band, um, but it, the batteries are much better than the rubber band, it seems. So um, the answer is I don't like engines and I like um, also in the American Soaring magazine, there was an article by a American sailplane pilot named Jack Lambie. I don't know how many people know of Jack Lambie, but he was a glider pilot. He had a, a Fournier motor glider and he wrote an article for Soaring Magazine called Heavy Trip in a Light Ship. And it was about an ultralight or several ultralight sailplanes that were traveling together and they were basically migrating cross country and their self-launching method was 
they had an electric winch inside the sailplane and they would make a wooden peg in the ground and they would self-launch themselves from a winch and then they would wind in their tow line. Um, so that was Jack Lambie's idea of how an ultralight sailplane could be self-launching, but. Eric, that, that's, that's a, that is a very amazing story um, about the, the self-launching uh, winch. Uh, I have a question from uh, someone from, from, Flor from Florida, from US. Wow. He's, a, he's a very technical pilot. He's a glider pilot and, a, and an instructor too. He mm -hmm. asked me um, to ask you, uh, where do you see this going? All of us, we're here tonight. We're, we're following your, your story. We're so amazed and we're so jealous of your experience. And we would like to see you proposing or telling us about the future and what kind of uh, commercial development of your product uh, that might you know, be spread around the world and maybe come available to every, every day's user. Because you said that you really are doing this for your passion, mm -hmm. that you're driven by your, pa from mm -hmm. your own passion, which is nice, but uh, you know, uh, what are the, the, the future? What kind of uh, proposal did you get or, or your intentions for this development? So, yes, we've, we've tried to market this idea, but um, it's not accepted well by power plans because they want more reliable propulsion day and night, all weather. And it's not acceptable for glider pilots either because they're predominantly competition and speed oriented. So it's, it's really, it's, it's um, amazing. One of my last passengers in Osopo was a, a professional paraglider pilot. And it, he said it changed his life because it was so fast. He thought that my solar airplane was unbelievably fast because he's used to flying paragliders. So, and hang glider pilots feel the same way. They are just amazed by the performance. However, sailplane pilots are, are not so impressed. They would rather simply fly on their wits. It's, it's easy for me to go up and find wave lift and thermals because I just use the motor. So it's not so much a sport, I mean, I think you could make um, something faster, but if you put solar panels, for example, into an Antares, it's not gonna make much difference um, that you have this solar power coming in. You know, the Antares electric motor glider, it's a good competitive sailplane, but it requires much more power, so. So at the moment, you, you don't foresee, you have not been approached, you're not been searching for uh, a partnership with uh, maybe uh, with some structure company that could um, uh, start producing and serious your, your project. Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm friends with uh, Shemp Hirth. They're actually one of my sponsors, um, but they have no interest in this and neither it's it's not um let's see how can i put it um I, I don't see the market for it because it's it's not as high performance as a sailplane in, in good weather sailplanes are are faster and they can fight against the headwinds better so I don't well, really I'm, see I'm, it. I'm yet. very surprised, Eric, because uh, you know maybe I, I've been seeing all this uh, explanation you give and these beautiful stories, and all I think is how much I wish I was with you with all these flights, and I wish I could have access to your machine. I was lucky enough that I cruised myself with a Fournier. You mentioned a Fournier, uh, yeah, from Arezzo to London, and that was uh, you know about 20 years ago, and I that will mm -hmm. never forget so all your flying is just absolutely beautiful the way you travel europe left and south uh, from the alps mm -hmm. to sicily and we're also happy that you chose an italy as a country to do all this flying well thank you well i i think it's it's a lot easier to come up from being a hang glider pilot to this than from a sailplane pilot to go down in performance um, because sailplane pilots always gonna miss 
having that the weight and the speed. Um, so um, it's it's possible um, in the future that there could be it, it needs to be ultra light in order to fly on solar power. So it's just, you know, the, for example, the front elect electric sustainer is a very good electric option. And I, I'm really happy that they can even self launch, for example, the, um, was it called the, the silent? It's Italian, Italian made. Um, the single yeah, seat. it's uh, yeah. Ali Sport used to make yeah. it, then it moved. Uh, yeah. yeah, we are proud that we were first. Unfortunately, as everything goes, uh, Eric, you know that it's timing. Silent came too early. It was I think they sold more in America than almost in Europe. You have a few models flying in U.S. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. you know, I had all the, the, the numbers, all the cars, but it did not. It was not in the good timing. So with the front electric sustainer, um, you're never going to get the high propulsion efficiency because of the small propeller. And the STEMI S10, I've, I've owned two STEMI S10s in the past. And... They don't, they do not, they, you can fly them as a powered airplane. Um, I've flown one across the United States and it, it didn't, it's not very efficient because of the small propeller. You need a large diameter propeller to be efficient. That's, I know. That is the, yeah, the, that has been the limitation. So yeah. Eric, uh, we're getting to the end. Uh, we've been Good. talking a lot and we really enjoyed uh, just one technical question I have for you, and then you can finish. You, I don't know if uh, what you have left. If I interrupted not, you, not um, much. One technical question is: uh, uh, one of our viewers asked me personally uh, to ask you about uh, the, the the lifespan, expected lifespan of your of your solar panels and uh, mm -hmm. the decay. How the, what you notice in decrease? Uh, how they decrease year by year? So let, make an example. How long do you expect to last, and uh, and also the what, what are you uh, decreasing in performance you've seen in the last few years? Well, the only decrease in performance is the batteries. Um, the solar cells. Um, I don't leave the airplane outdoors day and night, but um, the solar cells themselves basically do not degrade at all. It's more the lamination materials, and the being making everything waterproof it's actually easy to make it waterproof from the outside but you actually have moisture coming from the inside of the wing and the edges especially like the trailing edge because rain and dew collects on the very back edge and gets in the gap between the the flap and the aileron and it works it's so that we have some corrosion especially on the single seater um, but uh, we don't have any degradation so how long the, what's uh once you finished your model from day that, that you start flying how many years do you expect to to be flying it without any problems major problems at least 20 years okay and the batteries at the moment instead uh my batteries are 10 years old and um they're losing capacity but um but they're they're still working. Um, you're, still, they're, you're still happy. You're still satisfied. It, it really depends with the lithium batteries on how, okay, we try to store them cold. Like if I'm not here, if I have to work in the summertime, I take the batteries out and I put them in a refrigerator. Um, but um, if you run the batteries down low and charge them up high, you'll wear them out in about three years. So for okay. ab everyday flying, I only go 80% charge, 20% down. I don't, I don't use, you know, I, I, I don't have an actual cutoff on the batteries because I figure um, that if you need to make it home, I, for example, one time at Voguera, I went hunting wave lift uh, in, a, in the north wind in the Apenninis and I didn't find the wave. And I barely made it back. I had to run my batteries right down to zero. And I really thought I wasn't going to reach the airport. But uh, so there's no bottom cutoff. I, the pilot can destroy the batteries if he wants to. I decided to give the pilot that option. 
but there's an audio alarm. There's an annoying sound in the cockpit saying that you're damaging the batteries. So, Okay, um, Eric, um, I think we're getting to our end. Uh, okay. Aldo, unfortunately, Aldo had a problem connecting. So they, they asked oh. me to sort of fade, fade out this beautiful event where, uh, I mean, where I've noticed, uh, I was so impressed uh, uh, about the participants. We had about, you know, from 70 to 80 participants the whole evening. I was hoping for something more. I noticed that they were mm -hmm. all from all over the world as uh, Aldo uh, said at the beginning. So this is fantastic. Uh, it's, uh, you are, I, what, I, what I describe you as a frontier of flying for me. Uh, in general, in general, uh, and so we're very happy. Is there anything you would like sort of to say to our viewers? Uh, no, I just like to say hi to Brian Allen and uh, Kit Lee out there, and hopefully my friends and whoever family. I, it's kind of funny that it's a one-way communication, but um, I'll communicate with them by email and see how they what they thought. It's kind of a I, I strange organization the way I did it, but I mixed it all together. So fantastic. Listen, Eric, while we finish, and uh, Piero might also might uh, say goodbye to you, and maybe why he might want to say something. Uh, we can enjoy your lights, uh, your last slides. If you keep on pressing and show us, we really love your slides, and <laughs> and uh, and sure, maybe you know we can not do another session or something else another time soon but we okay well um the last thing i'd like to say is if um if there's anybody interested in flying in the sunseeker duo in this summer they should come and uh go on a we're going to go down um croatian coast it's not going to be wave soaring like you saw in the last presentation but we want to explore well, uh, you, you you extend my invitation to your wife. I, I I definitely I'm in Florence and I know your wife would love to come to Florence. And there's oh, plenty yeah. of airfields, so you have to bring you have to promise to bring the down sea, the Sun Seeker duo around Florence. You can stay with uh, with me and and we'll do okay. some flying together. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, I'd love. There's a there's a um, castle I'd love to go see. That's it's this uh, Moorish. Uh, I forget the name of it right now, but yeah, I know uh, where it is. It's right by Arezzo. Yeah. It's the Moorish castle, famous. Yeah, uh, I'd love to go see let, that. It's let's have uh, Pierre Fox maybe want to say something at the end. But also okay. Aldo is with us again. Aldo, welcome back to us. Thank you for your representation. Thank you. All. I just want to say something, Alberto. Alberto, thank you for oh, maybe, organizing. Maybe, maybe, no, maybe Eric would like to say something about the new, the new glider. Yeah. Oh. oh, which new glider? Uh, I saw, I saw a new, is mm. a new power, wow. a new glider, uh, to what? Well, few seconds ago. No. Ah, yes. Let me see if I can get there. Just a moment. Don't, don't, Eric. Don't keep secrets from us. We'll find out your your new projects. You have to tell us <laughs> all the secrets, eh? Be, be okay. nice to all the viewers. Let's see. How do I do it? Um, new share. I don't know here. Okay. I guess I'm. Well, uh, yes. I um, I would like very much to. How do I do this here? Come on. No. Just a moment. Yes, um, I like this Italian design very, very much. This is the Partanavia B86, which has changed names very many times. Technum. Technum. I know, but originally it was Partanavia. Um, Vulcan Air now. Yes, it's it's changed changed names many times well, we're we're sure very honored because you started with an italian glider caproni mm -hmm. and yeah. now you're finishing with another italian uh machine yes. so that's I, very for italy I, I love i love this airplane i've i've been inside them and i've imagined so normally it's only 12 meter wingspan but this one is 20 meter wingspan and it, it needs big wing to fly on solar power but this is 
designed for a customer in Africa who just needs short range transportation, short field takeoff and landing. And you can see this on my website. There's animations and um, it's got big, big landing flaps and powerful motors for short takeoff. So just please visit the website and you can read all about it. But I would, I would like to work with the Italian company in cooperation because they already have this very expensive or very beautiful optics on the nose because I love the forward visibility. And especially if you're flying in Africa, you need to be able to see the landing ground very carefully in case there's animals or obstacles. So you don't want to eat lions, right? Right. <laughs> I don't want to hit anything. So yeah, I would really like to build this and I, I know it it could be it could be practical for some applications such as these short range flights in Africa that I mentioned. So okay. Eric, does this uh, huge experience you have accumulated uh, provide you also with um, job opportunities and uh, probably? Yes. Uh, yeah? In fact, I have a meeting with the Japanese in uh, less than one hour. Oh, I see. I'm still working. Yes. I'm working on big solar drones um, for internet. Yes. I've been quite quite busy lately. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. we we're, we're very happy that you gave us this opportunity. We all look forward, and I think you know glider pilots. Yes, they they look for a performance, but but on the other hand, the the charm of electric flying it's a little bit something that has been mm -hmm. uh, you know wanted to to reach for, and you mm -hmm. made it. You made real a dream reality. So I think it's very well. Nice. In fact. In fact, on both my airplanes, um, I was a little bit too conservative and the wing is a little bit too big because I've never actually had to land. Um, and that tells me that I could have had a slightly smaller wing. So, but it can't be really small the way sailplanes are. Um, then you, you can have an electric motor, but uh, the solar panels aren't going to give you much of an advantage and air, airplanes like the e-genius that i mentioned before that airplane can't fly cross country very much because it, it needs a big charger so e-genius uh, their the infrastructure doesn't exist whereas with the sunseeker duo we don't need any infrastructure we have never used the charger when we're on a cross country flight we charge Jean-Marie Jean Clement Ask a few words about Solar Stratos. Ah, yes. Ah. Yes. Um, yeah, Raphael Donjam. Mm -hmm. Well, um, let's see. Yes, we've, we've been in contact um, and um, I've been watching his project, but um, I don't really know what I can say about it. It's... Um, it's another two-seat solar-powered airplane, but um, I, they've just really started started flying it. Um, I will see what they do this year. I don't know. I'm <coughs> excuse me. I don't know. Well, you, you're there in the middle, season. in the middle of all of this, and you you started it ahead of people so we really wish you that you you find your niche and you find your you know your product and you can uh thank you come, come back to us with uh and we say oh we knew the guy oh, oh we we know who the guy is uh, pierre fox you want to <laughs> well, you want to end the session okay i end the session eric thanks a lot for your speech okay. it was amazing experience Wow. And uh, stay, oh, thanks okay. to reply to all technical questions, of course. Uh, people love to know about Solar Glider. I was sure about this. Uh, we have that you have teach us many things about Solar World and also about uh, uh, your adventure, of course, <laughs> many adventures. I hope this technology will soon be available for everyone. And if will, that's also thanks to your work. 
Oh, thank we, you. We appreciate a lot your work. And uh, I think um, we conclude this evening to, of course, to thank all my friends who helped me to organize it this evening, Andrea Venturini, Davide Cescato, Alberto Sinoni, and of course, Aldo Cernezzi. Finally, I want to, to say something. I think we can learn an important thing tonight. Eric, you are writing the history. We are just read it. Thank <laughs> you to everybody. Thank you again. I see you on flight, okay. Eric, and all of you. Well, come, come and visit me in Osopo oh, when the weather is a little better. I do. I do. Thank you. Grazie. Grazie, Thank Eric. You Grazie, a tutti. Grazie a tutti per la bellissima serata. Grazie. Grazie. Mille. Ciao. Thank you very much. Ciao. Okay. Buonanotte, arrivederci amigos, paesanos. <laughs> ciao, <laughs> ciao Eric. Okay. Good, 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 night. good night, ciao. Eric, and uh, best regards to kiss to your wife. Okay, yeah, she's right here working, so. Right. Hasta la vista. Let's see, how do I go? Okay, stop sharing. Ciao, okay. ciao, ciao. buonanotte. Have a good night. Meeting. Bye, have a good one. Okay.